If someone teaches their child how to add without eventually teaching them how to subtract, have they really helped them see the whole picture? What about multiplication taught without division? Some subjects are like two sides of a coin. You need to understand both to really grasp the whole. In the previous episode, we took a fresh look at the ideas of addition, multiplication, and exponentiation, and technically counting, but that doesn't count. In doing so, we found something hiding in plain sight, titration. Indeed, we found an infinitely long chain of operations and a thread that binds them all together. But what happens when we invert these operations? The answer may seem obvious, but once more, we're going to discover something brand new, something that's been hiding in plain sight. First, I need to shoo an elephant out of the room. Yes, you. Just shoo. Shoo, 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 shoo. I will touch on the inverses of tetration, but really to go into them, it would require a couple of dedicated videos. Someday. Second, before watching this, I would suggest watching a few previous videos. Links are in the description. How should we approach this? Let's make up a quick chart and line up operations with their inverses. What's the opposite of counting? Or more specifically, counting up. Said that way, it's easy, counting down. Now let's think about subtraction, the next operation in our chain of inverses. A few questions have arisen. Do we find counting down packed in subtraction the same way we found counting up packed in addition? Yes, consider five minus three. This says, starting with five, count down to three, which leaves two. Check. Does reversing the operations give the same answer? Nope. Three minus five actually poses an interesting issue. If we start with three, counting down five seems to make no sense. After all, you can't get rid of five apples if you only started with three. This leaves us with two choices, the same two we've been faced with before. Ban the situation, that is, banning subtracting larger numbers from smaller numbers, or invent new mathematics. In this case, we've already invented the thing we need, negative numbers from the integers. So in this case, we get negative two. Indeed, with negative numbers, we can count down as far as necessary to resolve any subtraction problem we could possibly dream up. The next operation we need to flip is multiplication. Its inverse is division, which has some interesting issues. Take 15 divided by three. If we are right, then we should be able to find repeated subtraction packed in this. That is, start at 15 and keep subtracting away threes. So we get 15, 12, nine, six, three, and zero. That's five threes we took away, so the answer we get with repeated subtraction is five. This sure looks like the opposite of multiplication. Three times five is 15, so we got the right answer. The next issue is a bit more serious. What happens when you try to calculate something like 16 divided by three? Carrying out this operation feels like repeated subtraction of three again, only this time we don't land on zero. 16, 13, 10, seven, four, one. We can't go any further or the process will lead us into negative numbers and while they exist, they're not a part of this. If we did let it go into the negatives, you could just keep repeatedly subtracting forever and you'd never get a sensible answer. The numbers in this situation didn't divide evenly. We have a one left over, which we will call a remainder. Like earlier, we don't ban this. That, as you've probably figured out, is left only as a last resort. Instead, we'll build up mathematics around this idea and move forward. Our first method for thinking about this is just a way of writing it down. 16 divided by three is five, remainder one. This works, but it's not very elegant. Let's try again. Earlier in the series, we came up with the idea of a quotient, a rational number. Turns out we can use that here. On the top, the numerator, we have 16. And on the bottom, the denominator, we have three. They're both integers and the denominator isn't zero, so this number is definitely in the quotient set because it meets both rules. This fraction bar here means to divide the numerator by the denominator. Now, this form may seem a bit strange because it looks just like writing out a calculation that has yet to be done rather than writing out a usable number. This is, after all, the same thing as 16 divided by three. But it turns out that not only is this a good idea, we've also seen something much like it before. Remember the square root of two? We found that we had two ways of writing it, in square root form and decimal form. Both forms are useful. The decimal form can be truncated and used in calculations, while the root form lends itself to algebraic manipulations and simplifications. 16 over three is similar in that it can be turned into a decimal and truncated for use, or kept in precise form, well suited for algebraic manipulations. We call 16 over three an improper fraction, so called because the numerator, 16, is larger than the denominator, three. By contrast, a proper fraction has a numerator that's smaller than the denominator. Proper because you can imagine taking a single thing, say a pizza, and imagine cutting out exactly that amount of it. In this case, the sizes of the pieces are thirds, that's the three, and we have 16 of them. 
meaning we'd need more than five pizzas to have 16 thirds of it. This leads us to the next way we have of writing this, five and one third. If this was pizza, this would be five pizzas and a single one third sized slice. This kind of notation is called a mixed number. That is, we've mixed up integers and a proper fraction in the same number. But it's very useful. Cooking recipes, measurements for construction projects, and other disciplines all used mixed numbers commonly. Lastly, here's the decimal form. There's a process that does this by hand called long division, and it's not hard, but it can take some time. Now it's time to take a look at the blank across from exponentiation. What should go there? Let's back up and get some perspective and context. Inverting an operation means to do the opposite of carrying it out. Let's take a look at this example from before. 3 times 5 equals 15. When it comes down to it, inverting an operation in practice requires a number as well. That is, we can either undo multiplication by 3, or we can undo multiplication by 5. On the other hand, take a look at this equation. 3 to the fifth. What are we undoing? Turns out there are two options, having an exponent of 5 or having a base of 3. And because of this, there are two inverses. This is incredible. On the one hand, the operations form a single trunk. But the inverses on the other hand show there is a branching. One branch is taking roots, and the other is taking logarithms. Or to continue our tree-themed words, logs. Today we're going to talk about roots. Logs will do in the future, but it's going to require a lot of videos dedicated just to them. To understand these roots, we're going to need some notation so we can talk about them. This is called the radical, and the thing under it is called the radicand. This little number here is called the index, and it serves a purpose similar to an exponent, except backwards. Remember, an exponent says take the base and multiply itself by itself that number of times. Whatever you get is a result. Going backwards means you have the result as before in front of you, and what you're trying to figure out is what base got you there. Previously, with division, we knew what we were going to repeatedly subtract. Unpacking division yields subtraction, after all, and we could just do it. This is because with subtraction, you were given a clue in the number. It told you what to repeatedly subtract. We don't have that here. Instead, we have the number of times this mystery number was multiplied by itself to get the given result. Our first approach, then, might be to take a guess at the answer, repeatedly divide to check, and if all of the pieces fit, call it an answer. Let's try it. If I have this, the third root, or the cube root of 8, then we can take guesses as to what the answer is. Let's start by guessing 2. 8 divided by 2 equals 4, and 4 divided by 2 equals 2. We landed on our guess. So what this says is that 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, which is our radicand. So our guess was right. But what would happen if we guessed wrong? Well, let's guess 3. Incorrect, but illustrative. 8 divided by 3 is 2.6 repeating, and that divided by 3 is 0.8 repeating. We didn't land on 3, we landed on 0.8. So this isn't right. It says that 3 times 3 times 0.8 repeating equals 8, and because our 0.8 is different than our guess, then this isn't repeated multiplication by the same number, so it's not right. Another way we might guess wrong is given in this example. Consider the cube root of 16. Let's guess 2. 16 divided by 2 is 8, divided by 2 is 4, divided by 2 is 2. So we landed on 2, but hang on. This says that 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16, 4 twos. This is a cube root, meaning we have to multiply our guess by itself 3 times, not 4. So this guess isn't right. Here's the actual answer. <laughs> this begs the question, how on earth are you supposed to figure that out? Well, there actually is a process to figure it out called an algorithm. We've encountered an algorithm, at least by name, earlier, long division. An algorithm is just a process. However, the algorithm that figures out the cube root of 16, or even the square root of 2 for that matter, makes long division look like a walk in the park. Generally, I would recommend using a calculator to perform this kind of operation. Now that the inverses have branched, what does that mean for the inverses of tetration? The original operation of tetration could also be described as a superpower. Likewise, the two inverses of tetration are similar, super roots and super logarithms. But here's an interesting twist. There still are only two inverses, and we can see why if we think about it like we did before with powers. 5 to the superpower of 3 equals this humongous number. We have two things we can invert in this operation, having a base of 5 or a superpower of 3. 
Thus, we need two inverse operations. It seems like the branching won't grow any worse at the moment. Indeed, it looks like we'll have two inverse operations from here on out for the rest of these chains. In the future, there will be collections of videos that go deeper into the topics of logarithms and roots. Believe me, there's a lot to learn there. As for tetration and its inverses, I'll save those for a date in the far future. They are beautiful and interesting, but I want to go more deeply into things that are beautiful, interesting, and immediately useful. In today's episode, we talked about the inverses of addition and multiplication, which are subtraction and division. We discovered that the inverses of exponentiation, roots and logarithms, formed a branching point in that sequence, and that those two branches continue on down the chain, two inverses for one operation. Hmm. I don't know about you, but I still think that's a fascinating fact. Thanks to Aragami for hosting this episode of the Taylor series, and congratulations to you on successfully completing the next term in your own Taylor expansion. I'm Derek Taylor, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing.